this tomorrow morning. I promise it's not just more scrum porn, though. This is pretty good. Lucas sends it out wide, back inside to Pino. He runs through, lovely ball to Deporte and under the posts. Rappi! Hello and welcome to the Rugby Update. I have had my Easter weekend rest and I'm ready to dive back into the Rugby Meat Grinder. And what better way to get back into it than to make an impressions video of Chasing the Sun 2 Episode 3. I think it should be nice and chilled. That was not chilled at all. I was going to do some flippant review of the episode. I assumed it would be another by the numbers jobby, starting with player interviews, followed by planning and drills, and then ending with a match and some voiceover. High quality of course, but nothing new. How wrong of me, how dismissive, how disrespectful of the masters at the helm of this project. This episode starts at a million miles an hour with the now expected F-bomb laden monologue by Rassi. Except this time it's not aimed at the other team or their press or even at the Mad Max wasteland that is Clifton Beach. No, this time it's aimed at Sia, Eben and all the other players that could not beat Ireland. The pace barely lets up from there, giving you only a few breathers throughout the episode. But I will not spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it. Suffice to say we are shown more of the detail, the fear and the headaches in how this fucking physical sausage is made than ever before. Like with the previous episodes, the production quality is excellent and you can really tell that the filmmakers are a lot more confident in this second season. They use music and increasingly faster paced editing along with their incredible access to the team to build this episode to a crescendo so high that my heart rate was spiking and I could not fall asleep for hours afterwards. <sighs> Again, I must add the caveat that this show could only be made more for me if Rassi looked straight down the barrel and said, Rian, we are beating France especially for you. So some viewers mileage may vary. With all that said though, if you are in any way interested in documentaries or rugby or just good storytelling, I cannot recommend the show enough. It is incredible the amount of detail we are given and I can't believe how much the box we're willing to share. Five Malabas out of five for episode three, with the best moment being either the match itself, which is super intense, or Felix Jones walking into a team room with a laptop and bleary eyes saying, lads. I hope I haven't spoiled too much, just go try and watch it and we will be back for episode 4 next week. Now let's turn our eyes to the weekend's rugby for a quick quick rundown of the results. Specifically the first knockout round of the Investec Champions Cup and thankfully the end of having to keep track of 75 games a weekend in this competition. Glasgow travelled to Twickenham on Friday night to take on the Quins in a spicy looking matchup. And it turned out that way as both teams ran it all night leading to an entertaining 28-24 win for the hosts. My favourite genre of match was up first on Saturday, a bemused and increasingly disinterested European side getting hammered at Loftus. These usually end in massive lopsided scores and it wasn't any different this time as Lyon walked away 59-19 in the red. We headed to windy Cape Town next to see if the Stormers could beat back-to-back -back champions La Rochelle for a second time this season. They could not. A great match ended at 21 points to 22 for La Rochelle who hopped straight back on the plane before they could get blown into the ocean. The Exeter Chiefs are secretly kinda good at Europe, eh? They don't seem to get mentioned much during the tournament but they are right there at the pointy end of the season again after a great 21-15 win over Bath at an also very windy Sandy Park. Bordeaux is definitely getting mentioned because they are looking very very good at Europe. This was their second time hosting Saracens during the tournament and after the two matches they've racked up 100 sexy rugby points. Really really they play incredibly good looking rugby. The hashtag bowl was next as Leinster hosted Leicester in Dublin. It went as you would expect when every international ever to don the green jersey is playing against a club side. Good luck La Rochelle. Maybe the best game of the weekend was played between the Saints and Munster first up on Sunday. Both sides ran till their lungs burned and in the end the English Prem leaders took home the spoils. Ugh, the final game on Sunday was between a Dupont Intermac Toulouse and a Ficou Woki Racing. Did any of that make sense? The only thing that matters though is that Kulisi played and went off after 20 minutes. Who let this just be a fake injury so Kulisi can get some rest before the July internationals. Mm. All that now leaves us with the quarterfinals this coming weekend and I'm calling Bordeaux, Toulouse, Leinster and the Saints for the semifinals. 
That other competition also had its round of 16 this past weekend and now we sit with 6 out of the 8 quarter finalists all coming from the ERC. Yay us. Now, is there any news for once? Yes, for once there is some news. Hmm, apparently the Euro African and Super Rugby clubs are all working together to try and put on a Club World Cup every 4 years. The proposal is to have the Champions Cup finish where this year's comp is right now, with 8 quarter finalists going into a knockout competition against the top 6 Super Rugby Pacific clubs and 2 invited clubs, probably from Japan. Why don't they just let the winner of the Champions Cup play the winner of Super Rugby Pacific? Because money, you dummy! 4 weeks of knockout rugby in June sells more TV ads. And don't be so worried, it's only going to happen once every 4 years after the Rugby World Cup but before the next Lions Tour and it'll be done before the World Rugby Nations Cup thing and before the Springboks vs Allback Tours that they're planning and it's only going to start after the Urk is done and after Super Rugby is done and after Japan League 1 is done and then the players just have to get themselves up for one more major international tournament that probably crosses a bunch of time zones just after they did the Rugby World Cup and all its pre-games and all its pre-camps and no one should see anything wrong with this. Anyway, some good news. A few months ago, World Rugby announced that they had used AI and now probably traumatized human reviewers to track online abuse leveled against referees during the last Rugby World Cup. I will link the very interesting report below. They actually managed to find some online abusers and then charge them with the anti-online abuse laws of the countries those abusers reside in. Yesterday, World Rugby confirmed that a man in Australia has now been convicted of being a tosser online and has been fined 1000 kangaroo ears or whatever. It's obviously not a lot of moolah, but the fact that that person now has a criminal record is probably punishment enough. World Rugby also said that they will continue to use the robots for the next three years to try and protect their referees from the rampant online abuse in our sport. This is good and I hope it helps some people mature out of the 2003 era shock comedy nihilism bullshit that people seem to be perpetually stuck in online. Just be nicer. And it'll be a good thing if I end this week's episode right there. I will talk to you all next week so we can talk about the men's and women's mixed club world cup that will be running parallel to the autumn internationals but only every three years if it's a leap year and there's a full moon in feb and none of the players are dust yet bye